Section 11 of Global Trends 2030 Alternative Worlds by National Intelligence Council. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island. Few competing visions of a new international order for the moment. The replacement of the United States by another global power and erection of a new international order seems the least likely outcome of this time period. No other power would be likely to achieve the same panoply of power in this time frame under any plausible scenario. The emerging powers are eager to take their places at the top table of key multilateral institutions, such as UN, IMF, and World Bank. But they do not espouse any competing vision. Although ambivalent and even resentful of the U.S.-led international order, they have benefited from it and are more interested in continuing their economic development and political consolidation than contesting U.S. leadership. In addition, the emerging powers are not a bloc. They don't have any unitary alternative vision. Their perspectives, even China's, are more keyed to shaping regional structures. A collapse or sudden retreat of U.S. power would most likely result in an extended period of global anarchy where there would be no stable international system and no leading power to replace the U.S. When we have discussed decreasing U.S. power abroad, many scholars and analysts have tended to assume even greater levels of chaos and disorder would ensue than many U.S. experts. The Fog of Transition The present recalls past transition points, such as 1815, 1919, or 1945, when the path forward was not clear-cut and the world faced the possibility of different global futures. In all those cases, the transition was extended and rebalancing was partly a matter of trial and error. Domestic politics was an important factor shaping international outcomes. Going forward, U.S. domestic politics will be critical to how the U.S. conceives and prosecutes its international role. Many of our interlocutors stressed the need for developing a strong political consensus as a key condition for greater U.S. economic competitiveness. A divided U.S. would have a more difficult time of shaping a new role. The transition away from unipolarity toward new global leadership will be a multifaceted and multilayered process played on a number of different levels and driven too by the unfolding of events both domestically and more broadly in the rest of the world. World rebalanced parallels with the past? Some of our interlocutors drew parallels between the current period and the European long peace after 1815 set in motion by the Congress of Vienna. Similarities include a period of rapid social, economic, technological, and political change, and an international system which was largely multipolar. The Europe of 1815 consisted of a diverse set of autocracies like Russia, Prussia, and Austro-Hungarian Empire, and liberal states such as Britain and France. In such a world, Britain occupied a special role. It managed to play an outsized role despite its lack of overwhelming power capabilities. In 1830, Russia and France were roughly the same size as Britain in terms of GNP, and by 1913, the U.S., Russia, and Germany all had larger economies. Its global financial and economic position and empire role as offshore balancer in Europe and protector of commercial sea lanes linking its overseas dominions gave Britain the preeminent global role in the international system during the 19th and into the 20th centuries. The current multipolar system is also very diverse with an even larger number of players, think G20, and international economics and politics is much more globalized. In 1815, coming out of over 25 years of conflict, the great powers had conflicting views which they did not disguise, particularly at home. The Holy Alliance of Russia, Prussia, 
and Austria sought to fight against democracy, revolution, and secularism, but ended up finding it hard to coordinate collective efforts, and in any event, their efforts proved only effective temporarily, as revolutions and separatist movements continued across Europe throughout the length of the 19th century. A long general peace among the great powers prevailed, mostly because no one wanted to risk imposing its will on the others for fear of the larger consequences. Equilibrium was achieved in part because of the differences. Britain's role also outlasted its demise as a first-rate economic power, and despite the rise of several competing states, stayed preeminent in part because the others were reluctant to wrest leadership away from it until the First World War. Chapter 3. Alternative Worlds The substantial number of game changers and complex interactions among them suggest an endless variety of scenarios. We've sought here to delineate four archetypal futures that represent distinct pathways for future developments out to 2030. In reality, the future probably will consist of elements from all the alternative worlds. The graphic on the top of that page shows U.S. share of real global GDP under the four scenarios. The graphic on the bottom of the page at left illustrates patterns in the shift in global economic clout across regions, measured in terms of regions, countries, share of GDP in 2010, and in our four scenarios for 2030. The four scenarios are stalled engines, a scenario in which the U.S. and Europe turn inward and globalization stalls. Fusion, a world in which the U.S. and China cooperate, leading to worldwide cooperation on global challenges. Genie out of the bottle, a world in which economic inequalities dominate. Non-state world, a scenario in which non-state actors take the lead in solving global challenges. Alternative World 1, Stalled Engines. We chose Stalled Engines, a scenario in which the U.S. and Europe turn inward and globalization stalls, as one of the bookends, illustrating the most plausible worst case. Arguably, darker scenarios are imaginable including a complete breakdown and reversal of globalization due to a potential large-scale conflict on the order of World War I or World War II. But such an outcome does not seem probable. We believe the risks of interstate conflict will rise, but we do not expect bilateral conflict to ignite a full-scale conflagration. Moreover, unlike in the interwar period, the complete unraveling of economic interdependence or globalization would be more difficult and therefore less likely in this more advanced technological age with ubiquitous connections. Stalled engines is nevertheless a bleak future. Our modeling suggests that under this scenario, total global income would be $27 trillion less than under fusion, our most optimistic scenario. This amount is more than the combined economies of the U.S. and Eurozone today. In a stalled engines world, the U.S. and Europe are no longer capable nor interested in sustaining global leadership. The U.S. political system fails to address its fiscal challenges and consequently economic policy and performance drift. The European project unravels. Greece's exit from the Eurozone triggers the rapid unmanaged exit of the rest of the periphery. More nationalist, even nativist parties rise to claim positions of influence in coalition governments. By the 2020s, it looks like only a limited free trade zone will remain. Economic growth continues in major emerging markets and accounts for approximately three quarters of global growth. Nonetheless, fundamental economic and political reforms remain elusive in China and India. Corruption, social unrest, weak financial systems, 
and chronically poor infrastructures slow their growth rates. China's growth falls, for example, from 8% at the start of the period to around 3% by 2030. As pressures grow everywhere for disengagement and protectionism, the global governance system is unable to cope with a widespread pandemic that triggers panic. Rich countries wall themselves off from many developing and poor countries in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. By disrupting international travel and trade, the severe pandemic helps to stall out but does not kill globalization. On the sidelines of the annual Davos meeting, a number of multinational CEOs gather to discuss what they see as globalization stalling out. One of their members has asked the director of her strategic vision office to write a short paper describing the downward spiral, which is used as the basis for the discussion. The following is an extract from that paper. World Corp Strategic Vision Group. 1800 Ladbroke Lane, Suite 615, London, England, W105NE. I have to confess that I did not see it coming, but we have to face up to the fact that we are in a new world, one in which globalization is no longer a given. You may ask how this came about. The key was the inward turn of the United States. I think all of us thought that the discovery of shale gas meant that the U.S. was back, despite all the domestic squabbling. Clearly, we did not take into consideration the U.S. legal system. Not only did our earlier inflated estimates fall victim to slower-than-anticipated technological improvements in extraction efficiency and deposits that proved to be at the lower end of initial forecasts, but we failed to factor in the costly series of lawsuits against the energy producers. Then we were hit with a double whammy. Just when we thought Europe was digging itself out from Greece's unruly exit from the Eurozone and negotiating a new political and economic pact, the French people have revolted in the latest referendum on a new EU treaty. It was a devastating defeat for the French government and now a huge problem for everyone else. It is not clear that a new deal can be devised given the wide margin of defeat for the former treaty proposal. Increasingly, German elites are saying that Germany doesn't need the EU anymore. They want to get out now. I'm not sure the developing world understands the seriousness of these changes. I think there was, on their part, a certain schadenfreude rejoicing about the West's problems. China welcomed the U.S. decision to draw down its overseas forces, seeing it as a guarantee of U.S. non-interference, though Chinese liberals are chagrined because they saw a strong U.S. as keeping the pressure on Beijing for reforms. Beijing expects Vietnam and the Philippines to gradually back down in the South China Sea without strong U.S. support. China has its own share of problems. Fundamental economic and political reforms have stalled corruption and social unrest is slowing growth rates, which perhaps explains why the government is fomenting nationalism and becoming more adventurist overseas. Many Indian strategists have been leery of putting too much trust in the U.S. The recent U.S. drawdown confirms they were right. New Delhi has few other natural partners. India worries a lot about its influence in Central Asia. A Taliban coup recently occurred in which all the other factions which had formed the government were brutally suppressed. India, which blames Pakistan, sought Western help but was largely rebuffed. Indian distrust of China has also grown to the extent that no more BRIC summits are being held. Chinese and Indian diplomats won't sit together even in a multilateralist setting. China recently completed a 38,000 megawatt dam on the Brahmaputra, close to the disputed border with India, and has begun building another. 
China's decision to test Vietnam's determination to stand up to Beijing in the South China Sea has Indian officials on edge. In Delhi's view, China's aggression appears to be unstoppable without a greater U.S. willingness to intervene. It appears to be only a matter of time before China's blue water navy extends its sway farther west into the Indian Ocean. The global economy has suffered the consequences of the escalating tensions among the emerging powers. Global growth is now trending downward. Poorer countries particularly are suffering. During bad harvest years, more countries are creating export bans, exacerbating food shortages and price spikes. Another turning point was when the Middle East boiled over. Sunni Shia violence exploded in the Gulf Iran intervened to protect Shia in Bahrain, prompting Saudi military retaliation. Iran then announced that it would start testing a nuclear device. The U.S. debated whether to send the Sixth Fleet to the Gulf to ensure the free flow of oil, but Washington decided to take a wait-and-see approach. If I have to choose a moment when it was clear that the U.S. role had changed, this was it. Even the Chinese got worried about a diminishing U.S. role and sent their fleet to the Gulf of Oman. There appears to be no end in sight to the Sunni-Shia tensions. Saudi Arabia and Iran, both hit by lower energy prices because of the global growth slowdown, have nevertheless increased tensions by launching a proxy war in Syria and Lebanon. Hezbollah has also launched its first large-scale cyber attack against Israel and the United States. With large amounts of arable land, unconventional energy reserves, if the lawyers ever allow them to be tapped, and adequate water resources, the U.S. can be more self-sufficient than most other countries. The growing disorder outside the U.S. has strengthened those in favor of disengagement. In China, however, the party is increasingly under fire for what many Chinese people view as gross mismanagement of the economy. A coordinated general strike has been ongoing in several of the major cities. India's development has also substantially slowed. No government stays in power long, and there is a constant reshuffling of government posts among coalition partners. As with most ill fortune. Troubles tend to come in waves. A deadly virus, which scientists had warned about repeatedly, has erupted in Southeast Asia. Ironically, with the increased security and border controls, the U.S., some Europeans, and even China are better able to weather the pandemic, which is spreading quickly. Flights have been canceled and ship transports have been stopped. There are reports of tens of millions of deaths. Twitter tried to operate even at the height of the pandemic, but a number of governments pulled the plug, saying that the use of social media was responsible for the increasing panic. The virulent strain spread quickly outside Southeast Asia to South Asia and along the trade and travel routes to the Middle East and Africa. As a result of the pandemic, there is now a new map of the world in everybody's mind. I can remember when the world map was the British Empire, with a quarter of the Earth's surface colored in pink. Then we had the map of the free world, with Washington as its capital. Now the new mental map shows a devastated Southeast Asia and portions of India, the Horn of Africa, and parts of the Gulf, Many of these areas are still not getting any international assistance. This new mental map created by what happened to the poor and destitute and their being shunned by the rich countries, including China, is widening the gulf between north and south and east and west. The new map will be what survivors in the developing world carry around in their minds and, consciously or not, will inform thinking for a generation on world affairs. Even in the rich developed countries, which were spared the worst impact from the pandemic, the death toll reached several million. The youth were particularly susceptible. I can't tell you the psychological impact on the rich survivors. The worldwide pandemic has put globalization 
even more in disfavor. It was the coup de grace for many, sealing the case against what was seen as the rampant globalization earlier in the 21st century. Western multinationals have seen forced nationalization in Southeast Asia, India, and Africa. Governments there say those businesses which ceased their operations during the pandemic lost their rights to resume their businesses afterward. Still, I notice that Facebook is becoming more popular and that young people are also beginning to travel and study abroad. Maybe this augurs a rebound in globalization's fortune. Stalled Engines How Game Changers Shape Scenario Global Economy All boats sink in this scenario. Slower global growth is accompanied by higher food prices. Conflict A new great game ramps up in Asia. Sunni Shia violence erupts in the Middle East, pitting Iran against Saudi Arabia. Outside powers, such as the U.S. and Europe, decline to intervene. Regional stability. Southeast Asia and portions of India, the Horn of Africa, and parts of the Gulf are hit hard by the pandemic, undermining stability. Even before the pandemic, the breakdown in global governance has meant an increasingly unstable Central Asia and Middle East. Governance. Multilateralism comes to a halt following a worldwide pandemic. Rich countries panic and try to isolate poorer countries where the outbreak started and is more severe. Resentments build between East and West and North and South. Technology. Lack of technological improvements means the shale gas revolution is delayed. By end of scenario, however, IT connections are source of renewal, preserving globalization. U.S. Role in the World The U.S. turns inward. The U.S. public is no longer as interested in sustaining the burdens of global leadership and, following the pandemic, is more interested in building a fortress America. Stalled Engines How Major Powers Regions Fare in Scenario Europe Preoccupied by domestic turmoil, Europe sits with the U.S. on the sidelines. Russia Russian power in the near abroad has grown with the U.S. pullback from Afghanistan and Central Asia. China Fundamental economic and political reforms have stalled. Corruption and social unrest is slowing growth rates, which perhaps explains why the government is fomenting nationalism and becoming more adventurous overseas. India A U.S. withdrawal from Asia leaves India having to fend on its own against what it sees as an increasingly aggressive China. Brazil, middle-tier powers Brazil and the rest of South America are less affected by growing geopolitical tensions and the worldwide pandemic. As a major food exporter, Brazil has benefited from rising prices. It seeks to fill the vacuum created by a withdrawn U.S. and Europe. Poor developing states in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Poorer states suffer enormously in this scenario from rising geopolitical tensions and food inflation. Pandemic deaths are greatest in poorer countries, and recovery will be difficult with the breakdown in global economic and technological cooperation. Alternative World 2. Fusion. Fusion is the other bookend, portraying what we see as the most plausible best case. This is a world in which the specter of a spreading conflict in South Asia triggers efforts by the U.S. and China to intervene and impose a ceasefire. China and the U.S. find other issues to collaborate on, leading to a sea change in their bilateral relations, as well as to broader worldwide cooperation on global challenges. This scenario would only be possible through strong political leadership, that overrules cautious domestic constituencies and forges stronger international partnerships. As a result, trust between societies and civilizations would increase. In a fusion world, economic growth resumes 
as the initial collaboration on security is widened to include intellectual property and innovation to deal with resource issues and climate change. China, bolstered by the increasing role it is playing in the international system, begins a process of political reform. With the growing collaboration among major powers, global multilateral institutions are reformed and made more inclusive. In other words, political and economic reforms move forward hand in hand. In this scenario, all boats substantially rise. Emerging economies continue to grow faster than advanced economies, but GDP growth in advanced economies also accelerates. The global economy nearly doubles by 2030 to $132 trillion that year. The American dream returns with per capita incomes rising $10,000 in 10 years. Chinese per capita incomes also rapidly increase, ensuring that China avoids the middle income trap. In Europe, the Eurozone crisis proves to be the catalyst for deep political and economic restructuring. In addition to political leadership in states, the role of non-state actors is also key. Technological innovation rooted in expanded exchanges and joint efforts at the university and research lab level is critical to the world staying ahead of the rising resource constraints that would result from the rapid boost in prosperity. In 2030, the East-West Center, founded in 1960 by the U.S. Congress to promote better relations and understanding among the people and nations of the United States, Asia, and the Pacific through cooperative study, research, and dialogue, has decided to change its name to the Center for Global Integration. The inaugural address for the rechristened institution will be given by a noted archaeologist whose works underlining the similarities among civilizations are being rediscovered, winning public acclaim for his foresight. In recent years, he was beginning to doubt whether he was right as he recounts here. The growing tensions between the great powers had him on the brink of recanting what seemed like an overly optimistic view of global trends. In his address, transcribed here, he explains why those doubts have now dissipated and he is returning to his earlier rosy outlook. 2. Center for Global Integration From Dr. Arthur E. Kent Center for Global Integration Subject, Inaugural Address Transcript If you had asked me any time during the second decade of the 21st century, I would have told you that we were headed into a world catastrophe. It felt like what we read about the run-up to the First World War, when there were mounting frictions between the great powers. In this case, there was sparring between China and India, China and the U.S., and the U.S. and Europe, over Middle East policy, and among the U.S., India, and Pakistan, over Afghanistan. Talk about the great game. Everybody seemed to be playing it, despite knowing the harm it was doing to the global economy. The West was having a bad economic decade. The needed political and structural reforms in both the U.S. and Europe were taking time to produce a payoff. Much of Europe was dealing with the dramatic aging of its population. The United States was bogged down in long-running partisan debates. The surprise was China. Everyone assumed that it would continue to advance. No one anticipated the leadership's decision-making paralysis, and how the internal wrangling was taking a toll on China's economic growth. As Metternich was wont to say about France at the Congress of Vienna, if China sneezes, everyone else catches a cold. China did more than make everyone get an economic cold. China's leaders, despite or maybe because of the downturn, ramped up military spending, causing everyone's nerves to get on edge. In this environment of slowing global growth and increasing distrust, Indo-Pakistani tensions also flared in a year of drought. Pakistan accused India of holding back much-needed relief 
with its refusal to open its dams along the Indus. Delhi viewed the increased militant infiltration in Kashmir as a Pakistani provocation. It also detected Islamabad's hand in a plot by extremists to blow up the Mumbai Stock Exchange. India mobilized its army. The major powers were scrambling. Beijing sent a secret envoy to Washington with a ceasefire plan. Together, the U.S. and China brought the plan to the U.N. Security Council. China promised to inject massive amounts of humanitarian and development aid if Pakistan seized further retaliation. The U.S. and Europe threatened massive sanctions if India did not withdraw. The U.S. and China are co-sponsoring peace talks in Geneva to settle issues such as Kashmir and Pakistani support for militant groups. No one would have predicted such a positive outcome. A lot depended on the personal ties between U.S. and Chinese leaders. Both leaderships disregarded the objections raised by mid-level bureaucrats to cooperating with the other and have been awarded Nobel Peace Prizes for their joint initiative. The leaders saw the danger of a major war for everyone's future and acted. They also wanted to do more, hence their decision to ignite a global technological revolution. Developing technological solutions to major challenges had an electrifying effect, particularly for younger generations. Whereas the 2010s were all doom and gloom, the 2020s turned suddenly into a golden age for technology. Mechanisms for global sharing of innovation were established by China and the United States. Global education exchanges flourished like never before. Turkey, Russia, and Israel, for example, became creative hotbeds for cross-cultural fertilization. Knowledge industries spread into Africa and Latin America. In this collaborative environment, a global consensus for action on clean energy and food security emerged. U.S. labs led in producing new materials to support improved energy storage. Scientists based in India worked on more decentralized energy systems serving rural areas. Brazil became the center for work on a new green revolution. The Gulf states have seen the writing on the wall and are rapidly diversifying their economies. Their efforts to develop strong universities, which began with U.S. and Western help, have paid off for the region. The Gulf states now have a highly trained and entrepreneurial elite. A sort of contagion took hold, somewhat along the lines of what happened in Asia in the 1970s and 1980s, and the Middle East is experiencing rapid economic development. Years from now, I think that historians will see changing immigration and mobility as the foundation for the growing political and technological cooperation. For good or for ill, a cosmopolitan elite with ties to multiple countries has formed. These elites are comfortable working and living in multiple places. Even the less skilled are more mobile, filling in gaps in many aging societies. The increasing spread of biometrics has meant that government authorities can now easily track flows of people. The number of illegals in America or Europe has dropped. As a result, governments are more confident about allowing expanded flows of workers. There is less talk of declineism the United States, or Europe's. World attention is now more focused on how to protect the biosphere, given the rampant growth unleashed by greater international cooperation. Plant and insect species are dying off at an alarming rate due to the rampant urbanization and agricultural revolutions. The size of the middle class has exploded across the globe. Even Western middle classes are getting richer. It is a never-ending cycle. New technologies are replacing or making available resources go farther. But the growing number of nouveaux riches 
are causing cities to swell and rural areas to depopulate. Other environmental concerns have also become troubling. Several recent typhoons have been unusually powerful, causing an unprecedented number of deaths and greater physical destruction than ever before. Arctic ice melted at a far more rapid rate than anticipated, and rampant exploitation of resources in the Arctic has begun. Methane gas levels are rising rapidly, exacerbating climate change scientists' fears. South Asia is still a concern. Cooperation elsewhere and pressure from other powers such as China and the U.S. have persuaded the Indians and Pakistanis to increase their strategic dialogue and to begin to open trade flows. India's rapid economic expansion fuels distrust, suspicion, and envy among Pakistanis. Pakistan has not ceased its nuclear modernization program, is still a battleground for competing interests. A page has been turned in human history. No more competition over resources. Fusion. How Game Changers Shape Scenario. Global Economy. All boats substantially rise. Emerging economies continue to grow faster than advanced ones, but GDP growth in advanced economies also accelerates. The global economy nearly doubles by 2030 to $132 trillion that year. Chinese per capita incomes rapidly increase, ensuring that China avoids the middle income trap. Conflict. The specter of a spreading conflict in South Asia triggers intervention by the U.S. and China, leading to a ceasefire and settlement. Such success breeds broader cooperation on global and regional challenges, lowering risks of conflict. Regional Stability Tensions remain in South Asia, the Middle East, and elsewhere, but increased multilateral cooperation on poverty and climate change lessens the risks of instability. Europe rebounds. A liberal China increases possibilities for regional security in Asia. Governance. Cooperation initially based on the U.S. and China coming together quickly spreads. Greater democratization takes hold first with a more liberal regime in China. Reform of the multilateral institutions is a final stage following deepening cooperation among powers. Technology. The rapid expansion of scientific knowledge is a key factor in sustaining a more cooperative world. Technological innovation is also critical to the world staying ahead of the rising resource constraints that would result from the rapid boost in prosperity posited under this scenario. U.S. Role in the World. The American dream returns with per capita incomes rising $10,000 in 10 years. The United States technological surge and efforts to end conflicts are the basis of U.S. leadership. Talk of U.S. declineism has abated in this new environment where cooperation has replaced competition among the great powers. Fusion how major powers, regions, fare in scenario. Europe. In Europe, the Eurozone crisis proves to be the catalyst for deep political and economic restructuring. Russia. As technology becomes the source of international legitimacy and status, Russia starts rebuilding its S&T sector. Russia becomes a creative hotbed for cross-cultural fertilization. China. China emerges stronger with its soft power enhanced and begins to move toward democracy. It assumes increased global and regional roles. India. India's high-tech industries benefit greatly from the new cooperative environment, 
while Sino-Indian ties improve, India still struggles to overcome historic tensions with Pakistan. The advances in energy and water help to ensure continued economic development. Brazil Middle Tier Powers Brazilian scientists are on the forefront of the new green revolution for Africa. With more cooperation among the great powers, middle-tier powers find that they play less of a global role than when U.S. and China competed for their support. Poor Developing States Poor states benefit greatly from the technological advances in food and energy. Some states continue to teeter on the edge of failure, but many more are doing better in the cooperative atmosphere. End of section 11. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island. Section 12 of Global Trends 2030, Alternative Worlds, by National Intelligence Council. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island. Alternative World 3, Genie Out of the Bottle. Footnote. The genie in this scenario title refers to the genie coefficient which is a recognized statistical measurement of inequality of income. And footnote. In genie out of the bottle, inequalities within countries and between rich and poor countries dominate. The world becomes wealthier as global GDP grows, but less happy as the differences between the haves and have-nots become starker and increasingly immutable. The world is increasingly defined by two self-reinforcing cycles, one virtuous leading to greater prosperity, the other vicious leading to poverty and instability. Political and social tensions increase. Among countries, there are clear-cut winners and losers. Countries in the Eurozone core that are globally competitive do well, while others on the periphery are forced out. The EU splinters and eventually falters. The U.S. remains the preeminent power, achieving an economic turnaround fueled by its new energy revolution, technological innovation, prudent fiscal policies, and the relative weakness of many potential competitors. Without completely disengaging, however, the United States no longer tries to play global policemen on every security threat. Parts of Africa suffer the most. The secessions of Eritrea from Ethiopia and South Sudan from Sudan are seen in retrospect as precursors of this era in which the boundaries across the Sahel are redrawn. States fragment along sectarian, tribal, and ethnic lines. The shale oil and gas revolution that benefits the U.S. proves disastrous for those African countries dependent upon oil exports. The failed states in Africa and elsewhere serve as safe havens for political and religious extremists, insurgents, and terrorists. The transformed global energy market and Saudi Arabia's failure to diversify its economy hit Riyadh particularly hard. Saudi Arabia's economy barely grows during this period, while its population continues to increase. Saudi per capita income declines from almost $20,000 today to just over $16,000 by 2030. In the face of this economic challenge, the kingdom no longer possesses the resources to play a major regional role. Elsewhere, cities in China's coastal zone continue to thrive, but inequalities increase. Social discontent spikes as middle-class expectations are not met, except for the very well-connected. Fishers appear within China's leadership as members struggle for wealth, which in turn breeds self-doubt, undermining the legitimacy of the ruling institutions. Having an increasingly difficult time governing, the party reverts to stirring nationalistic fervor. 
in this world the lack of societal cohesion domestically is mirrored at the international level with europe weakened and the u s more restrained international assistance to the most vulnerable populations declines major powers remain at odds the potential for conflict rises an increasing number of states fail fueled in part by the lack of much international cooperation on assistance and development economic growth continues at a moderate pace but the world is less secure owing to political and social fissures at all levels in 2028 the editor of the new marxist review launched a competition for the best short essay on the meaning of Marx and communism 210 years after Marx's birth in 1818. In her surprise, the journal was flooded with thousands of submissions. She was having a hard time sifting through the piles and selecting a winner, but she found one that pulled together many of the recurring themes. The essay made the case that Marx isn't dead, but is instead thriving and doing better in the 21st century than anybody could have imagined just 15 or 20 years ago. The following are excerpts from that essay. Marx, updated for the 21st century. The breakup of the EU a couple years ago was a classic case of Marxist inevitability. In a sense, what we saw was a transposition of the class struggle onto a larger regional landscape, with Northern Europeans in the role of exploitative bourgeoisie and the Mediterranean South, the defenseless proletariat. These tensions, as Marx and Lenin, by the way, tell us, cannot be resolved except through conflict and breakup. At first, it looked like the process of reorganizing the EU into tiers could be orderly, with the less well-off taking a back seat without much fuss. Unfortunately, Brussels did not address growing resentments among the have-nots. Practically overnight, we saw this process turn into chaos. EU Commission offices were attacked and burned down, not just by rioters in many southern European cities, but also in major cities in the richer north. For a while, it looked like we would see a reenactment of the 1848 revolutions. Unemployed youth in even the better-off northern European countries taking to the streets in sympathy. The EU's websites were hacked into. Its internal system was inoperable for months due to sabotage. The class struggle is widening into a new dimension that did not occur to Marx. A generational war appears to be afoot. The recently organized youth parties in England and France are calling for cutbacks in social entitlements for the elderly. They also want higher education fees to be drastically cut. We've seen growing class divisions elsewhere, pointing to a potential global revolution. Beijing's power over the provinces has been declining. China's coastal cities continue to do relatively well because of their overseas commercial links and richer domestic markets. Government efforts to build up the new interior cities have floundered. Little investment money is flowing in. A Maoist revival is underway there, and a party split seems inevitable. The Chinese should have known better. They inducted too much of the rising bourgeoisie into the party. This was bound to create conflict with the real workers. I don't see any resolution except through more class warfare and conflict. The Marxist and Maoist-inspired insurgencies are increasingly spreading in rural areas all over the world. India has a long history of Naxalist insurgencies, which continue to grow stronger. Interestingly, counterparts are rising up in urban areas. There you see a lot more crime. Much of it is sophisticated, making it impossible for the bourgeoisie to wall themselves off into gated communities. I know of some bourgeois families that have reverted back to paying for everything with cash. Every time they have banked online, 
or used a credit card cyber criminals who appear to have composed a list of targets, siphon off funds from their accounts, and charge enormous sums to their credit cards. Banks are finding maintaining security to be increasingly costly. In the Middle East and parts of Africa, unfortunately from a Marxist point of view, the terrorists and insurgents are still falling back on religion or ethnicity. The Saudi authorities are reeling from increased homegrown terrorists attacking the wealthy, citing their irreligious behavior. Every day in Saudi Arabia or one of the Gulf countries, another luxury mall is bombed by self-styled jihadists. Nigeria is virtually split with the Christian communities under siege in the north. The transposition of the class conflict along sectarian, tribal, and ethnic lines in Africa means the old colonialist map has been virtually torn up. By my count, there are 10 new countries on the African continent alone. In the Middle East, we now have a Kurdistan carved out from several countries. Winston Churchill and Gertrude Bell, architects of a united Iraq after World War I, would be spinning in their graves. Of course, the West and China have yet to recognize many of these partitions. They are like ostriches with their heads in the sand. There's too much veneration for those so-called venerable statesmen who drew up the old imperialist maps in the 19th and 20th centuries. I'm not sure that the U.S. is yet ripe for revolution. It's done too well from shale gas. The working class there got lulled by the increased manufacturing possibilities as businesses moved back from Asia when U.S. domestic energy prices dropped but it could be just a matter of time. Entitlement reform in the 2010s didn't happen because U.S. growth picked up. U.S. debt has continued to climb. It is only a matter of time before entitlements will be back on the political agenda. The onset of a global downturn, with all the turmoil in Europe and elsewhere, is beginning to stir up class tensions. The U.S. thinks it is immune, but we'll see. Unfortunately, opposition activists in America no longer read Marx. One thing Marx would have reveled in is the power that the proletariat now has. These revolutionary groups have many more destructive means at their disposal, from drones and cyber weapons to bioweapons. I worry that the tensions could get out of hand and the counter-revolutionaries will strike before the downtrodden have built up their strength and perfected tactics. In a sense, with the wider access to lethal weapons, there is less inequality than Marx imagined. However, the bourgeoisie are beginning to understand. The wealthy cities and towns will no doubt build up their security forces to deal with the constant disruptions and riots. The U.S., some Europeans, Chinese Communist Party leaders, Russian oligarchs, and others are talking about a global initiative against cybercrime. It's paradoxical. Years ago, the U.S. and Europeans were glib about the need to keep the Internet uncensored and available to all. The Chinese and Russians were concerned about such freedoms getting out of hand and tilting the balance too much in favor of empowered individuals. Suddenly, the scales have dropped from the Americans' eyes and class interest is back in vogue. Oh, that Marx could see that the class struggle never did die. Globalization has just spawned more of it. Genie out of the bottle. How Game Changers Shape Scenario. Global Economy. The global economy grows at a rate of 2.7%, much better than installed engines, but less well than in fusion or non-state world. The U.S. achieves an economic turnaround fueled by its new energy revolution and the relative weakness of many potential competitors. By contrast, growth slows in China, with fears rising that the country will not escape the middle-income trap. Countries in the Eurozone core that are globally competitive do well. Some on the periphery are forced out. 
the EU splinters and eventually falters. Conflict. Rural, urban, and class tensions erupt, particularly in Africa and parts of the Middle East and Asia. The scope of conflicts grows as insurgents and terrorists employ drones, cyber attacks, and bioweapons. Regional stability. Parts of Africa fare the worst, with increasing fragmentation along sectarian, tribal, and ethnic lines. Middle East borders are redrawn with an emerging Kurdistan. Political, social, and generational conflict is rampant in Europe, China, and India. Governance. The lack of societal cohesion domestically is mirrored at the international level. With Europe weakened and the U.S. more restrained, international assistance to the most vulnerable populations declines. More states fail and more are partitioned. Technology. The fracking technology behind the U.S. energy revolution hits energy producers like Saudi Arabia very hard. States increasingly worry that technology has given individuals too much power. By the end of scenario, Western powers are joining with China, Russia, and others to restrict Internet freedoms. U.S. Role in the World The U.S. becomes more restrained in fighting global fires. The few that threaten clear national interests are extinguished, but many are allowed to burn. By the end of the scenario, however, the U.S. is beginning to ally with authoritarian states to try to restore some order because of growing non-state threats. Genie out of the bottle. How major powers regions bear in scenario. Europe. Collective Europe is a shell. There is more diversity than uniformity across countries. The Euro crisis turned out to be a devastating blow to aspirations for a Europe as a whole, playing a dynamic role in the international arena. Russia. Inequalities at home become a bigger issue with Russian elites, allying with counterparts in U.S., Europe, and China to stem the rise of cyber criminals. China. China struggles to maintain its previous high economic growth rate as divisions between urban and rural populations grow. Owing to increasing discontent at home, the regime is losing legitimacy. A Maoist revival is underway with growing divisions in the party. India India struggles to keep up its growth rate as the rural Naxalite insurgency spreads. Brazil Middle-Tier Powers Brazil's efforts to fight inequality pay off with less domestic instability than in most other states. The rise of Kurdistan is a blow to Turkish integrity, increasing the risks of major conflict in its surrounding neighborhood. Poor developing states in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Poor states suffer from the overall slower economic growth rates. Domestic conflicts worsen the outlook for food production. Humanitarian crises overwhelm the international system's ability to provide assistance. Alternative World 4. Non-State World In a non-state world, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, multinational businesses, academic institutions, and wealthy individuals, as well as subnational units, such as megacities, flourish and take the lead in confronting global challenges. New and emerging technologies that favor greater empowerment of individuals, small groups, and ad hoc coalitions spur the increased power of non-state actors. A transnational elite, educated at the same global academic institutions, emerges that leads key non-state actors major multinational corporations, universities, and NGOs. A global public opinion consensus among many elites and middle-class citizens on the major challenges, poverty, the environment, anti-corruption, rule of law, and peace, form the base of their support and power. Countries do not disappear, but governments increasingly see their role 
as organizing and orchestrating hybrid coalitions of state and non-state actors, which shift depending on the challenge. Authoritarian regimes, preoccupied with asserting the primacy and control of the central government, find it hardest to operate in this world. Smaller, more agile states, where the elites are also more integrated, are apt to be key players, punching way above their weight, more so than large countries which lack social or political cohesion. Global governance institutions that do not adapt to the more diverse and widespread distribution of power are also less likely to be successful. Multinational businesses, IT communications firms, international scientists, NGOs, and groups that are used to cooperating across borders thrive in this hyper-globalized world where expertise, influence, and agility account for more than weight or position. Private capital and philanthropy matter more, for example, than official development assistance. Social media, mobile communications, and big data are key components underlying and facilitating cooperation among non-state actors and with governments. In this world, the scale, scope, and speed of urbanization and which actors can succeed in managing these challenges are critical, particularly in the developing world. National governments that stand in the way of these clusters will fall behind. This is a patchwork and uneven world. Some global problems get solved because networks manage to coalesce and cooperation exists across state and non-state divides. In other cases, non-state actors may try to deal with the challenge, but they are stymied because of opposition from major powers. Security threats pose an increasing challenge. Access to lethal and disruptive technologies expands, enabling individuals and small groups to perpetrate violence and disruption on a large scale. Terrorists and criminal networks take advantage of the confusion over shifting authorities among a multiplicity of governance actors to acquire and use lethal technologies. Economically, global growth does slightly better than in the genie out of the bottle scenario because there is greater cooperation among non-state actors and between them and national governments on big global challenges in this world. This world is also more stable and socially cohesive than non-state world and stalled engines. In 2030, an historian is writing a history of globalization and its impact on the state during the past 30 years. He had done a doctoral thesis on the 17th century Westphalian state system, but hadn't managed to land an academic job. He was hoping that a study of a more recent period would give him a chance at a big-time management consultancy job. Following is a synopsis of his book, The Expansion of Subnational Power. Globalization has ushered in a new phase in the history of the state. Without question, the state still exists. The continuing economic volatility in the global economy and need for government intervention shows that the state is not going away. However, it would also be wrong to say that the powers of the state have remained the same. During the past 30 years, subnational government authorities and the roles of non-state bodies have greatly expanded. This has been especially the case in Western democracies, but the increase in subnational power has spread far and wide. The West no longer has a monopoly. The expansion has been fueled by the formation of a transnational elite who have been educated at the same universities, work in many of the same multinational corporations or NGOs, and vacation at the same resorts. They believe in globalization, but one that relies on and benefits from personal initiative and empowerment. They don't want to rely on big government, which they see as oftentimes behind the curve and unable to react quickly in a fast-moving crisis. This can-do and everyone-can-make-a-difference spirit has caught on with the rising middle classes around the world, 
which are increasingly self-reliant. It's fair to say that, in a number of cases, the rising middle classes distrust the long-time elites who have controlled national governments in their countries. Hence, for the rising middle classes, working outside and around government has been the way to be upwardly mobile. Denied entry at the national level, many, when they seek elected office, see cities as stepping stones to political power. This new global elite and middle class also increasingly agree on which issues are the major global challenges. For example, they want to stamp out cronyism and corruption because these factors have been at the root of what has sustained the old system, or what they term the ancien regime. The corruption of the old elites has impeded upward mobility in many countries. The new elites believe strongly in rule of law as a way of enforcing fairness and opportunity for all. A safe and healthy environment is also important to ensuring quality of life. Many are crusaders for human justice and the rights of women. Technology has been the biggest driver behind the scenes. With the IT revolution, all the non-state bodies, from businesses to charities to universities and think tanks, have gone global. Many are no longer recognizable as American, South African, or Chinese. This has been disconcerting to central governments, particularly the remaining authoritarian ones, which do not know whether to treat them as friend or foe. The technological revolution has, in fact, gone way beyond just connecting people in far-flung parts of the world. Owing to the wider access to more sophisticated technologies, the state does not have much of an edge these days. Weapons of mass destruction, WMD, are within the reach of individuals. Small militias and terrorist groups have precision weaponry that can hit targets a couple hundred miles away. This has proven deadly and highly disruptive in a couple of instances. Terrorists hacked into the electric grid and have brought several Middle Eastern cities to a standstill, while authorities had to barter and finally release some political prisoners before the terror hackers agreed to stop. Many people fear that others will imitate such actions, and that more attacks by ad hoc groups will occur. We have seen in the past decade what many experts feared for some time, the increasing overlap between criminal networks and terrorists. Terrorists are buying the services of expert hackers. In many cases, hackers don't know for whom they are working. A near-miss bioterrorist attack occurred recently, in which an amateur's experiments almost led to the release of a deadly virus. Fortunately, the outcry and panic led to stronger domestic regulations in many countries, and enormous public pressure for greater international regulation. As an example of the enhanced public-private partnership, law enforcement agencies are asking the bio community to point out potential problems. In light of what could happen, the vast majority of those in the bio community are more than eager to help. However, most everyone has recognized that action at the country level is needed too. Thus, the original intent of the Westphalian system to ensure security for all is still relevant. Since the near-miss bioterror attack, no one is talking about dispensing with the nation-state. On the other hand, in so many other areas, the role of the central government is weakening. Consider food and water issues. Many NGOs sought central government help to institute countrywide plans, including pricing of water and reduced subsidies for subsistence farmers. There was even that huge G20 emergency summit after the wheat harvests failed in both the U.S. and Russia, and food riots broke out in Africa and the Middle East, which called for a new WTO round to boost production and ensure against growing export restrictions. Of course, all the G20 leaders agreed, but when they got back home, the momentum fell apart. 
The momentum took a dive, not just in the U.S. and the E.U., where the lobbyists sought to ensure continued subsidies, but also in places like India, where subsistence farmers constitute important political constituencies for the various parties. Five years later, no progress has been made in restarting a World Trade Organization round. On the other hand, megacities have sought their own solutions. On the front lines, in dealing with food riots when they happen, many far-sighted mayors decided to start working with farmers in the countryside to improve production. They've dealt with Western agribusiness to buy or lease land to increase production capacities in surrounding rural areas. They are increasingly looking outside the countries where the urban centers are located to negotiate land deals. At the same time, vertical farming in skyscrapers within the cities is being adopted. This effort of each megacity looking after itself probably is not the most efficient. Many people not living in well-governed areas remain vulnerable to shortages when harvests fail. Those living in the better governed areas can fall back on local agricultural production to ride out the crisis. In general, expanded urbanization may have been the worst and best thing that has happened to civilization. On the one hand, people have become more dependent on commodities like electricity and therefore more vulnerable when such commodities have been cut off. Urbanization also facilitates the spread of disease. On the other hand, it has also boosted economic growth and meant that many resources, such as water and energy, are used more efficiently. This is especially true for many of the up-and-coming megacities, the ones nobody knew about 10 or 15 years ago. In China, the megacities are in the interior. Some of them are well-planned, providing a lot of public transportation. In contrast, Shanghai and Beijing are losing businesses because they have become so congested. Overall, new or old, governance at the city level is increasingly where the action is. We've also seen a new phenomenon increasing designation of special economic and political zones within countries. It is as if the central government acknowledges its own inability to forge reforms and then subcontracts out responsibility to a second party. In these enclaves, the very laws, including taxation, are set by somebody from the outside. Many believe that outside parties have a better chance of getting the economies in these designated areas up and going, eventually setting an example for the rest of the country. Governments in countries in the Horn of Africa, Central America, and other places are seeing the advantages openly admitting their limitations. Non-state world. How game changers shape scenario. Global economy. Global growth does slightly better than in the genie out of the bottle scenario because there is greater cooperation among non state actors and between them and national governments on major global challenges. The world is also more stable and socially cohesive. Conflict. Security threats pose an increasing challenge as access to lethal and disruptive technologies expands. Terrorists and criminal networks take advantage of the confusion over shifting authorities and responsibilities and the multiplicity of governance actors to establish physical and virtual safe havens. Regional stability. Regional institutions become more hybrid as non-governmental bodies become members and sit side by side with states. Mayors of megacities take a lead in ramping up regional and global cooperation. There is increasing designation of special economic and political zones within regions to spur economic development. Governance. Countries do not disappear, but governments increasingly see their role as organizing and orchestrating hybrid coalitions of state and non-state actors that shift depending on the challenge. Multinational businesses, IT communications firms, international scientists, 
NGOs and groups that are used to cooperating across borders thrive in this hyper-globalized world where expertise, influence, and agility count for more than weight or position. Technology. Social media, mobile communications, and big data are key components underlying and facilitating cooperation among non-state actors and governments. U.S. Role in the World The U.S. has an advantage because many non-state actors, multinationals, NGOs, think tanks, and universities originated there, but they increasingly see themselves as having a global identity. The U.S. government maximizes its influence when it organizes a hybrid coalition of state and non-state actors to deal with global challenges. Non-state world. How major powers, regions, fare in scenario. Europe. Europe thrives as it uses its soft powers, NGOs, universities, and global finance and business to boost its standing. The emphasis on coalition and inclusivity in this world play to the Europeans' strength of coalition building to solve challenges. Russia. Moscow is increasingly concerned about security threats posed by the growth of terrorist and criminal organizations. Russia finds it difficult to work with the proliferation of global non-state actors in the international arena. China. China, as an authoritarian regime, is preoccupied with asserting the primacy and control of the central government and finds it difficult to operate in this world. India. India has the potential to flourish with its elites embedded in global business and academic networks. If it manages its urban challenges, it also can serve as a trailblazer to others in the developing world grappling with rapid urbanization. Brazil, middle tier powers. Middle tier powers play an outsized role where size and weight are less important than engagement in networks. The degree to which they have a highly developed non-state sector will be an important determinant of success in this world. Poor developing states in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The degree to which developing states manage urbanization will determine whether they thrive or fail in this world. National governments that stand in the way of emerging urban clusters are likely to fall behind those who use urbanization to bolster economic and political prospects. End of section 12. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island. End of Global Trends 2030, Alternative Worlds by National Intelligence Council.